All right. Um, welcome. Uh, well, hello and welcome everyone to Politics and Prose Live. My name is Bashan Horsley. Um, I am with the event staff, Politics and Prose. Um, before we do begin, just want to go over a couple quick items. Uh, first, at any point during this event, you can go to the chat section, uh, which you can find button forward below, uh, to access a link to purchase a copy of the new map from Politics and Prose directly. Um, that would be appreciated and of great help. Um, secondly, I would ask that if anyone has any questions they would like to direct to uh, the author, you would put them into the separate Q&A box um, so that we can just try to keep things a little organized here um, and make sure we can get every question we can. Um, that aside, I would like to welcome to Politics and Prose Live tonight, Daniel Jurgen. Daniel is a highly respected authority on energy, international politics, and economics, and the Pulitzer Prize winning and best-selling author of The Prize, The Epic Quest for Oil, Money and Power, The Quest, Energy, Security, Remaking of the Modern World, and Shattered Peace, The Origins of the Cold War, and co-author of Commanding Heights, The Battle for the World Economy. He is Vice Chairman of IHS Market. He is joined tonight by Susan Glasser. Susan is a staff writer at The New Yorker, where she writes a weekly column on life in Trump's Washington. Glasser has served as the top editor of several Washington publications. Most recently, she founded the award-winning Politico magazine and went on to become the editor of Politico throughout the 2016 election cycle. She previously served as the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy, which won three national magazine awards, among other honors during her tenure, and also Susan will be appearing herself on PNP Live on Thursday, October 1 at 8 p.m. with her new book, The Man Who Ran Washington. Um, that said, uh, turn it over now to you, Daniel and Susan. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, it is just a delight to be here at Politics and Prose tonight. Deshaun, thank you. Dan, I'm just delighted to be with you and congratulations, uh, you know, for all of those who are spending your evening with us, we appreciate it. Uh, we might not be as entertaining as a presidential press conference, but I think you'll learn a lot more. And Dan is the kind of expert that you can take his word to the bank too. So <laughs> you. he will not be contradicted uh, in the course of this hour. Um, seriously, this new book, Dan, I, I have to say, it was a delight for me to dig into uh, the book, which is called The New Map, uh, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. Uh, as an author who's coming out with a new book in two weeks, I have to say you should all buy the book, which of course I know as loyal politics and prose uh, viewers uh, and customers, you're all planning to do, but it goes without saying, I think they have a nice link right there uh, in the uh, chat function for you. And I know Dan is uh, eager to and happy to sign book plates and the like too, but housekeeping out of the way, Dan, I, I really was eager to dig into this book because I think it, it it's an, you know, an antidote in a way to this moment, which, you know, is not only like turbocharged in the very infinitesimal news cycles that, you know, aren't just hourly news cycles now, but are sort of like minute by minute news cycles. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 it's a useful corrective in the sense that, you know, you're offering us some much longer term thinking uh, about the shifting geopolitics of the world, not only, of course, the effect of climate change, uh, on the, the world's map and sort of the energy transformation that's going on, but actually what that means in a world of nation states uh, and you know questions about globalization and the coronavirus. So I feel like it's, it's both super timely, but it's also a way for a minute of escaping from the news cycle in a way that I certainly found refreshing, uh, you know, spending the rest of my time watching the sort of daily car crash that is American politics. So. Thank you for that and for affording me some respite. Why don't I just start by asking you, uh, what is the new map as you see it? Uh, that's a very provocative notion. Isn't a map, map a fixed and stable uh, uh, perspective? What, how, can, how can a map uh, change? Well, thank you, uh, Susan. And uh, thank you for doing this, uh, particularly because I know that you're gearing up for a very important launch of a very important book about the man who ran Washington, James Baker at a time when Washington was very different. Uh, so 
I think if that too will provide a very important perspective on our times today. So thank you for doing this. And I look forward to watching you at Politics and Prose in two weeks. Uh, secondly, I just wanna say, I know there are people who are watching from all around the country, but for those of us who, are, who live in Washington, uh, Politics and Prose is not only a treasure, but it's really part of our lives in a unique way. And it's certainly been mine for a couple of decades now. And I think we're all, it's one of America's great bookstores. And I think uh, what they've done with PNP Live uh, is a very innovative way, particularly to deal uh, with the life of books and life of ideas in this COVID era. So uh, like Susan, very pleased to be able to join it tonight. On your question, uh, you know, as you say, a map suggests stability, but really the new map is about disruption and so many different forms of disruption are happening and it really is trying to be a map through that disruption in terms of geopolitics, uh, in terms of energy, in terms of how we live. And disruption was a factor, even major factor, even before COVID. And of course, now is the very fact of doing this this evening shows uh, the disruption. So that's what I uh, tried to do is kind of give a framework and put a lot of pieces together in a very confused time. Well, that's right. And I, I think one of the questions is, whether by the new map you mean that there will be a, a kind of a rearranging of power dynamics in the world that we might pay less attention to parts of the map that we have been the middle east for example uh when um when my husband and i moved to moscow to become the uh correspondents there for the washington post it was a long time ago 20 years ago one of the most interesting things we did before we left is we, we went and we had um, lunch with uh, so an expert here in town whose focus was Central Asia. And he showed us a map that he had had done, which uh, didn't show, you know, typical like Europe at the center uh, of things, or, you know, there's the North America centric maps we're used to, uh, but his was a map with Central Asia in the center. And it changes your perspective really on how you analyze all political events, right? You see Iran right there. You see how, you know, close, in fact, the sort of underbelly of the former Soviet Union was to the Middle East. So just this week, we've had this ceremony on the South Lawn of the White House with the foreign ministers from UAE and Bahrain there with President Trump uh, and Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and it inevitably raises questions of, uh, can the United States move on? from this, this uh, sort of obsession with the Middle East or you know, being trapped in the kind of energy dependence and therefore the energy politics that comes with it. Uh, you know, is that part of your new map? Is, is well, it is, I mean, really, I mean, if I say, what is the new map at its heart? It's the new map of energy and geopolitics and how they go together. Yeah. Exactly the way you phrased it is a classic, the Middle East. I mean, when I originally started doing it, you know, it was really just looking at the the idea came seeing the change of trade flows and how that map was changing. And that was really the kind of dramatic factor. And then it really became this metaphor for the world and uh, new maps. And I think what happened yesterday on the White House lawn uh, is part of the new map. And it's part of, there's a section called the maps of the Middle East. And this really is a rewriting of that map and rewriting of the power relationships. I think it's partly, uh, Obviously, the U.S. is very involved, and yet at the same time, it also perhaps is a message that the U.S. may be less interested in the region and the regional powers have to come together. And of course, it's also, you know, write a lot about Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the other countries vying for influence and position, of course, Israel. And, uh, you know, this is a group coming together that's focused both on Iran and on Turkey. And I think one other thing that was involved too was a year ago, a little over a year ago, there was a drone attack on a big Saudi oil facility. Yeah. And I think drones and cyber attacks say the elements of security in a military sense have changed. And I think this is an effort to also address that. So it is a, you know, it is a change in this map. It's, an, it's another big change. And I think more will follow from it. Well, it's not surprising in that sense that part of the reason for the rearranging of the power maps of the world is the incredible story here in the United States of uh, the rise of uh, uh, fracking and the, the making the United States into the world's largest uh, uh, oil and gas producer in a way that has changed 
America's relative power in the energy wars. It might make it less dependent on the Middle East. But I think we should talk for a second about uh, an even more surprising finding in the book, which was your argument that actually China, which we're used to thinking of as a very dependent, uh, you know, on uh, outside countries because it's not able to sustain its own economy through its own uh, oil and gas production, that China might actually be the winner of the next round of energy transformation. I found that to be a really provocative uh, and different idea. Well, it is, uh, China is, um, right now, it is, it, it, Chinese oil industry actually is like the fifth largest in the world, but China's demand has grown so much that China imports 75% of its oil. And so in thinking about what has become this new phrase that's used all the time, energy transition, it was thinking who are the winners, who are the losers? And China has two big kind of winning positions in it. One, if it's less dependent on oil, then because it moves towards electric cars and so forth, that enhances its strategic position vis-a-vis -vis among other people, the United States. The other is that China has really carved out a leadership position, what are called new energies. About 70% of the world's solar panels come from China. That's one reason solar costs have gone down so dramatically, and they have. Uh, they dominate the lithium battery supply chains. And so, you know, we move in that direction. They're in a very strong position there. And so, uh, you know, so you see, you know, China is kind of looking to the future. The only thing I, I do want to add is that half of the wind and half of the solar in the world is in China, but China is also adding three new coal fire plants a month. So it's kind of all of the above. Right. Well, it's not, in other words, it's not just a sort of going to be a clean energy superpower. But to your point, I think you said uh, in the book that 80% of the world's battery manufacturing capacity right now is located in China. So yeah, the, and the, yeah. the, the supply chain, that's right. Well, and that's a striking number if you think that we're moving in that direction. But there's another number that kind of blew me away that suggests how much work there still is to be done when it comes to, if you want to call it an energy transformation. Uh, the number that you used in the book was essentially that 84% uh, of the economy is still dependent on fossil fuels, which as I understand it is the exact same percentage more or less as uh, it was 30 years ago. Yeah, basically, yes, exactly. So that, you know, there's a big, you know, we're in a post-Paris climate conference move, but the reality is this dependence is there and on these fuels. And that's why in this book is about you know, you can't write about energy transition without writing about energy, and energy is such an important part of geopolitics in general. If you're looking at U.S.-Chinese relations or relations with Russia or, of course, the Middle East, uh, you know, energy is part of it. So you, this is the here and now that's, um, that I try to address and to make sense of in the new map. Well, but it, just to, to dig into that number, so 84% suggests uh, we haven't exactly transformed uh, our economies yet, although uh, you do point out the number of uh, dependents on coal, you know, here in the United States has gone down pretty significantly, and there has been uh, a rise in things like uh, wind and solar. You've always been a little bit of a skeptic when you and I have talked before about those alternative energy sources, but there's clearly been a change in the last few right. years. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you know, one of the things you see is actually energy transitions take a long time. Modern wind and solar uh, energy came from the 1970s. And, you know, in fact, in my previous book, The Quest, I, you know, where did these industries come from? And like, you know, the wind industry was basically born out of, uh, with, out of the mating of Danish wind machines with California wind policy in the 1980s. Uh, solar was started in the 90, you know, modern solar industry, with two pioneering companies, one of them was Exxon that, you know, started it. But for 40 years, they were very small and they were not economic, they're not competitive. But technologies mature and around 2010, the cost of wind and the cost of solar started to go down. So I write in the book about a shale revolution, but there's also a solar revolution and how much solar costs have come down making it much more competitive uh, than it was before. And that's a change from, you know, just 10 years ago. Well, but how realistic is it that we're going to see, you know, a, a significant move in the, say, the next decade on that overall number of dependence on fossil fuels? Well, I, I think in the next decade, it's going to be, uh, 
it, it's really the decades beyond that that you'll see the change because, um, you know, cars, the average car in America stays on the road for 12 years. So people aren't going to throw away their cars. You know, you just don't, you're not going to change it overnight. Uh, India is going to continue to grow. China is going to continue to grow. Chinese oil demand is actually back to where it was prior to COVID. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, you, you, you don't rebuild the whole base of, uh, of our economies, which is what's really being talked about in energy transition in 10 years. And I think even in 30 years, you only get, you know, part way because it's just, it's so big and so complex in ways that, you know, people don't even fully comprehend. Yeah, I think that your background as a historian here, uh, you know, you talk about when was it that uh, oil was first, uh, you know, discovered or put to use in the U.S. in the in the 19th century, uh, and how long until the U.S. economy became? It took, yeah, it took over a century. Oil discovered in 1859. It took over a century before oil became the dominant energy source in the world. Uh, you know, coal was the first energy transition. You know, it started in the Middle Ages when uh, wood became in short supply in England and the price shot up. But I said that the really decisive moment, I went back, I believe while I researched this book, you know, when, did, when was the turning point? And I said, it's 1709, in January of 1709, when an uh, English uh, uh, metal worker found a way to use coal to make iron more efficiently than wood. It took two centuries for coal to become 50% uh, of world energy supplies. Now, of course, we're in the 21st century. We have a lot of technology a lot of money, a lot of ingenuity, uh, and a lot of political determination. You know, they didn't have that in 1709. But, um, but it's still, the system is just so massive. And, you know, if you look at oil, it's used for many more things than, uh, than just transportation. You know, a hospital operating room, everywhere you look, it's plastic. The tools that put a, a stent into the alien heart of a person, those are plastic. So there's, it's more than just... Uh, transportation, people tend to think, oh, oil is transportation. You know, oil is, you know, sanitary food as well. So, you know, the, on this history point, um, four years ago, we heard that, that coal was going to miraculously come back. Uh, give us a quick check-in, reality check on that. It's not, not come back, right? Well, not come back in the United States. It's going south right now. And uh, coal used to be, not so many years ago, 50% of our electricity it's way down and natural gas, which was 18%, is now about 34, 35% wind and solar rising. Other parts of the world are still using more coal, particularly uh, in Asia. But in, in, you know, it's been squeezed out of North America, been squeezed out and it's been squeezed, been squeezed out of, largely out of Europe. So let's talk for a second about the United States. There has been this uh, shale revolution. You start the book, in fact, with the, the great and interesting story of how that came to be, uh, despite really the skepticism of just about everybody. Um, you know, how, how permanent is that? And, and how seriously do you take the political backlash against uh, fracking right now at a time of growing concern about the environment in the US? Well, let me take two parts of it. Um, first, it was a few stubborn individuals really made it happen because the textbook said it was impossible, but technology marches on and two technologies were put together. It took about 20 years to develop. Again, things don't happen overnight, but the scale of it is it made the United States, the world's, instead of the world's largest import of oil, it made the United States uh, the largest producer of oil. It's created you know, a lot of activity for manufacturers in uh, the Midwest over $200 billion of investment, $260 billion, $200 billion of investment in uh, new factories in the U.S., balance of payments. Um, and it's also been quite an impact on our foreign policy. Uh, you know, but the other side of it, as you said, there's this people who just don't like it in principle. And I, you know, I worked uh, with the Obama administration when they were looking at the environmental questions around it. And the conclusion was that if it's properly regulated, it's an industrial activity, it's, it's productive and it's constructive, and it seems to be largely uh, properly regulated, and, uh, and it's, you know, it's created several million jobs. Um, but I think the full, imp you know, people don't understand all those other impacts around it. But, you know, I think also people don't finish the sentence. Mm -hmm. If you said, let's ban fracking, which I'm not sure you could do it, you could restrict it, but Let's say 
you know, otherwise known as hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling to give it its, its complete name. What would happen? Well, we still have 280 million cars. So what would happen is we'd start importing a lot more oil again, and it would really be, uh, you know, beneficial to oil exporting countries because it would create a gap and they would be very happy to fill it and we'd be back to being much more highly dependent on imported oil. Just so that would be the consequence. Just to be clear, have you looked at the um, energy plans of uh, the two candidates? I mean, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the campaign so far uh, about energy, especially in the battleground state of Pennsylvania, which has now become very uh, dependent on fracking as the major industry, uh, especially in Western Pennsylvania. Both uh, Biden and Trump have been there in recent days. Trump says that Biden wants to ban fracking. Biden says he doesn't want to. Uh, why this political focus on this well, in Pennsylvania? Well, Pennsylvania, because it's a really important swing state and it has a lot of electoral votes and uh, it doesn't take very many votes to have it swing in one direction or another. I think the difference, you know, clearly the Trump administration would, the second one would continue the path to the first one, which has been supportive of uh, domestic energy development. And, and Donald Trump likes to be, uh, promote uh, US LNG sales of liquefied natural gas to other countries, particularly if you can take markets away from Russia. Uh, I think Biden's, it's more complicated. He's come out with a very ambitious and wide ranging $2 trillion climate plan. And it would do, you know, big effort in a lot of directions to move the US in an energy transition towards what's called cleaner energy. At the same time, as you point out, when he was in Pennsylvania and he said, I'm not going to uh, ban fracking, let me repeat, I'm not going to ban fracking, you know, and so I think he uh, would look and say, well, this is an important industry. Uh, it has a lot of jobs involved in it. It's important to the U.S. economy and its political position. So uh, I think it would be a kind of mixed position. And I don't think he wants to be the president who would preside over a really rapid increase in U.S. oil imports. So he has a, t I mean, Trump's kind of just down one road. Right. Biden has a more complex uh, position, and uh, I think it was kind of reflected in that, those statements that he made in Pennsylvania the other day. But it sounds like your view is that he would essentially uh, reflect some of the thinking that you saw in the Obama administration, you know, that they would be supportive, but much, much more focused on energy transition and the climate than the Trump administration. That's right. Really, if I can use that phrase, if it's not an appropriate step on the gas on climate, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, this other industry is there and realizing that, you know, your climate plan is not going to uh, change things in 2025 or 2027, but, you know, the decade of the 20s would be a preparation for the succeeding decades. So let me ask you, I want to get back, you just mentioned Russia for the first time, and both of us have a longstanding interest, of course, in Russia. Let's just finish quickly on the U.S., do you see increasing pressure because of uh, what's happening with the climate, because of how the world is changing, the wildfires in California and the like, do you think Republicans are going to give up on their policy of climate change denialism? I mean, is that going to... Well, I think, I think it's even mixed within the Republican Party. I, I don't think there's a, a unified position on it. And you have Republicans, including somebody that you've uh, just written the biography of named James Baker, yes, that's true. Who, who is supporting a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, you know, no one can say he's not a Republican. So, uh, <laughs> right. as you know better than I do. So I think it's mixed, but I think the forest fires, the tragedy, the scale, the, the scariness, the, the destruction of it certainly pushes climate change more to the fore in the campaign. And you've seen uh, uh, the two candidates really exchanging very sharp words against each other related to uh, coming out of the forest fires. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, obviously we don't know what the post-Trump Republican Party sort of official kind of ideology is going to be and whether that's going to be in a few months or four years from now. Uh, you know, I do think it'll be interesting to see whether uh, essentially that's a position that gets left behind. Uh, yeah. And, you know, in terms of the geopolitics, oh, let, let me just say one thing. I mean, I think that one of the very first things that the uh, a Biden administration would do is rejoin uh, the Paris uh, right. Climate Accord. I mean, that would be, you know, almost task number one. And so I think there's a lot of momentum to do.
do that. So that would be a quick, you know, maybe like January 21st. Yeah, I think they've said they're going to do it on the first day, although they're, they're really, it's going to be a busy first day because I suspect there's going to be some pandemic related business too, uh, yes. if, it, if it comes to that. Um, yes. So Russia. Okay. Russia is the other, Russia. you know, kind of the third pillar of this book in, in a way. Uh, and, you know, it's the area in which Russia remains a superpower, even though, as you point out, it's actually got an economy that's smaller than Italy's uh, because of its uh, status as an energy powerhouse, as well as still holding nuclear weapons. Uh, it's been able to play an outsized role in the world uh, for these two decades of Putin's rule. Will that continue? Well, I think it's interesting. You know, one of the big questions I faced in this book was to say whether Russia's economy is somewhat smaller than Italy's or somewhat larger than Spain's. I decided, you know, I think most recently just smaller than Italy's, but not much bigger than Spain's. And yet, as you say, uh, Vladimir Putin has succeeded in restoring Russia as a great power and a player around the world. Uh, and if Biden is president, just think about it, Susan, he will have dealt with five U.S. presidents. He's seen presidents come and go. So he has a different perspective. But uh, he was a great beneficiary of the, what's called the super cycle commodity boom in the first decade. He came to power uh, of the century when oil prices had collapsed and he just rode those prices up. And that was, you know, enabled him to really consolidate uh, his position and, and use that as a base. Uh, and so Russia is still the largest exporter of natural gas and it's a major exporter of oil. And one of the ways that the world has changed, and I describe it particularly in a chapter called The Plague, which deals with what's happened in, in 2020, is that, you know, the frame of reference that many Americans have is OPEC versus non-OPEC going back really decades. But in fact, uh, the world of oil now is really the world of the big three, which is the United States, Russia, and uh, Saudi Arabia. And we saw that demonstrated just a few months ago in April when it was the United States that when oil prices collapsed, uh, did this incredible sort of diplomatic act of bringing uh, these countries together to stabilize the price and, uh, you know, kind of demonstrated the change. But Russia is, you know, is, it's 40 to 50% of the Russian budget comes from uh, oil and gas. So uh, it's a country that depends upon it. And, you know, and that's been a source of, uh, it's one of the sources, as you say, of its position in the world. What's interesting is that for as long as uh, Vladimir Putin has been in office, and you point out it's, it's two decades now, uh, in fact, people are always shocked when I, when I say Putin is the longest serving leader of Russia since Joseph Stalin, uh, and at age 67, he could yet surpass him. Well, with the, with the constitutional amendment that was passed that he can remain president until 2036, that gives him a lot of runway to be there longer than Stalin. It is you know, amazing. He's, he's basically president for life. If he's choosing. Well, that's right. But so, to, but interestingly enough, he has not used that time and power to reform Russia's economy. Right? It it remains a petrostate. It remains highly, highly dependent on natural resource extraction, even now. Yes. Uh, you know, there's a constant discussion about the need for reform to bring in reformers. To by the economy, but the, those oil and gas revenues are very attractive. I mean, Russia is a more diversified economy. It's the largest exporter of wheat in the world, but still oil and gas is at the heart of it. And I have an anecdote in the map where I asked, actually had the opportunity to ask Putin about diversifying his economy, but uh, by accident, I mentioned the word shale and he uh, got quite upset with me and started shouting and it was in like front of 3000 people. So it was not a comfortable position to be in, but I think it, it you know, it, 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 there's a talk about reform, but it just doesn't happen. And people keep thinking something else will happen and then the reforms will begin, but so far not. Well, what's interesting is that you see, obviously, the very different course taken by China uh, just across the border. Uh, and I'm not aware of uh, Russia really making any significant inroads or efforts into the kind of technological revolution that will power the next stage of the energy transformation or you know any new energy technologies well, that they're... it's interesting because they're you know they have a very accomplished mathematics and science but yeah. that ability to you know and there are many very successful russian entrepreneurs 
but there happen to be in the United States, the culture to do it. Uh, but they're, you know, what we know that they're, we know what they're, two things that they're good at, uh, cyber uh, interventions. Uh, and uh, well, we, we know that they can do a fast vaccine, but, um, you know, which they're apparently now being tested, but it's not clear that it's gone through phase three testing. So, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, they, so they, they do have considerable scientific technology, but it's just, they don't have an environment that it encourages one of our great strengths is we go from basic science to startups to big companies and no one has that kind of e ecosystem that we do. And that's a great advantage for the United States. Yeah, so they don't seem to have made any big bets on becoming a new energy powerhouse. They're no, still no they're, they're still interested in traditional energy power. That's right. Well, what, uh, and, and, and also traditional geopolitics, by the way. I mean, if anything, you could say that Russia and Putin, particularly in his two decades on the world stage, has been really a leading proponent of the idea that uh, we should return to more of a realpolitik world yeah. of the, the 19th century. Yeah, the, so there's a great, you know, I have a great photo section in the book and one of it is of this titanium flag that was planted at the bottom of uh, the Arctic Ocean, uh, claiming the Arctic Ocean as, you know, as a, as a Russian ocean. And I think that the quote with the Canadian foreign minister said something like that, though, this is, that's like the 19th century. We don't do that anymore, but it turns out some people do do that. It is very 19th century. It's a concert of great powers. Well, that's right. You know, and, and I think, and I think, I think one of the things we've seen is that, you know, Putin wants to be treated as a great power. Exactly. And, uh, and he knows how to play that game. There's a great picture of him in, in the book of doing a judo flip. And he knows how to take advantage of other people's weaknesses, other nations' weaknesses. Well, and that's interesting because he, as long as he has a seat at the table, uh, you know, a world of great power competition benefits him, even though his economy is so much smaller than China's or the United States. Yeah. And, the, you know, the relationship, I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book that's really important is, and it's very, you know, our relationship with Russia for many good reasons has gotten worse and worse. Things keep happening, but, and we put sanctions on, but he's gotten closer and closer uh, to uh, China. And I describe one scene where uh, Putin is in front of an audience saying to Xi Jinping, I'm sorry, I kept you up talking till 4 a.m., you know, your time. But Xi Jinping said, that's fine, because we always have, we never have enough time to talk. I'm sure one of the things they both talk about a lot is their problems with the United States. But China basically is the, is the supplier of kind of modern technology to Russia. And Russia, except, and weapons, Russia is a supplier of modern weapons to China, which is interesting, which they had been resistant to do because they were worried that the Chinese would steal the technology, but now they say it's a priority. But right, primarily it's raw materials. And so, you know, I say that the relationship between Russia and China used to be based upon Marx and Lenin, and to some considerable degree today, it's based on oil and gas. Well, it, to that end, I mean, Putin has not hesitated to be really somewhat of a bully in using his resources as a tool in geopolitics. You see that in a lot of how he's dealt with his neighbors over the years, Ukraine, for example. There's now the uh, sort of very intense pipeline politics around uh, his supply of gas to Europe through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is extremely controversial in Germany. Uh, Trump has sought to make that uh, uh, a point of tension in the U.S. relationship with Germany. And now with the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, who is um, Putin's essentially his major internal uh, uh, rival inside well, Russia. And, and maybe we'd say even challenger. Well, exactly. You know, and uh, a modern day dissident, it, it seems. Um, he just was given, uh, you know, flown to Germany for medical treatment. They confirmed that uh, a chemical weapon essentially in the Novotok family was used to poison him. There's now talk in Germany uh, that uh, even by leading uh, members of uh, the parliament there that uh, they should consider halting this Nord Stream project uh, because of yeah. Russia's actions. And that, you know, so interesting because that's an $11 billion project that was like three weeks away from being finished and yeah. uh, US sanctions stopped it. And it was, 
in December, and you know, sometimes Susan, you know, you sit down, you're writing a book, you see how things fit together <laughs> that you don't see in the flow of news. That right when we put the sanctions on that and sort of froze it, at least turned it into suspended animation. Uh, that almost within the days, uh, Putin and Xi Jinping had this very elaborate tripart ceremony where they turned the the, uh, the the switch on for this huge power of Siberia pipeline sending Russian gas to China. And it was very symbolic of the sort of breakdown over here and this that relationship uh, over there. And uh, to say that that pipeline is controversial would probably even be an understatement right now. I mean, we're, you know, some of the senators have threatened to put sanctions not on Russia, not on the pipeline, but on parts of, you know, German governmental authorities, which is, um, you know, probably in some way, uh, Russia and Putin like to see these fissures between the U.S. and its Western allies. In fact, they probably like to see it quite a lot. Well, clearly, uh, he has seemed to uh, both encourage and actively foment those divisions inside our society. Um, in terms of the energy piece, do you think that China would act uh, as it increasingly grows into being a new energy powerhouse, as you predict in the book? Do you think that they will use uh, the same kind of bullying tactics that, that uh, Putin has used? Well, there was one occasion when uh, there was a dispute between uh, China and Japan where suddenly the rare earth that uh, Japanese manufacturers needed was suddenly not available from China. I think we're gonna see, and I would tell people to keep an eye on this, over the next year, there's gonna be a lot more, t as, a, as a climate agenda is pushed, there's gonna be a lot more attention to the relationship with China and its role in the supply chains for uh, renewable energy. And, uh, you know, what we've seen with TikTok and Huawei, you know, I, we could see there'll be an effort to create, you know, alternatives kind of supply chains not to be so dependent on, on, on China. And it's kind of also a symptom of this larger breakdown in the relationship between the US and China which is so different from what it was even five years ago. Well, that's right. I mean, it might be one thing that uh, Democrats and Republicans, broadly speaking, agree upon. Well, right? I, think, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think, as you know, you, 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 you watch Washington very carefully. One of the few things that Democrats and Republicans agree on is uh, this kind of uh, uh, concern about China. I mean, maybe the only other thing they agree on is their concern about Russia. And there's not much else that they agree on, but but that China issue has really, you know, from national security types to uh, labor unions to um, uh, you know a whole host of people. I mean, it's a real change, uh, and I call it in the book. I said there was this WTO consensus when China joined the World Trade Organization that you know this connection would be good for everybody, but now it's um, you know that's that's gone away, and instead to use the language you used before, Susan, it's great power competition, strategic rivalry, and both the Chinese, you know, I, I have a section on that in book and read both the Chinese most recent and the most recent US military defense postures, and they both use similar language speaking about each other. Well, so first of all, I wanna ask uh, those uh, who are listening to us, and thank you again, Dan's book is The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations, and you can buy it right now on the Politics and Prose website. Uh, you can also ask a question, and we will get around to questions soon, so go ahead and put any questions that you have in the Q&A function, if you can, on your Zoom screen. That will be the easiest for me, uh, so please go ahead and type out some questions, and we'll be happy to get to them in just a, a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, Dan, this issue of, you know, people compare it to the Cold War. Is this a new Cold War? Is it uh, a decoupling of the two largest economies in the world? Is it even bigger? Is it the end of the globalization era and, and a renewal of a sort of uh, uh, muscular nationalism uh, as the guiding sort of international hand? What, what's your take well, on that? Well, I, uh, I think you've just done a very good summary of it, actually. That, uh, when I was introduced, that book, my original book on the origins of the Cold War was mentioned. Here, you know, as I was writing this over the last two years, it seems to me, you know, are we heading into another Cold War? And, uh, and you know, Commanding Heights was about a, an integrated global economy, and now I think it's definitely fragmented. You hear that language about decoupling. I think it's complicated, you know, because 
General Motors sells more cars uh, in China than it does in the United States. China is a very important market for Apple. You know, it's a great growth market. Can we really use Apple? But you know, we're certainly moving in that way, and a lot of the focus is on technology and technology transfer and sensitivity about that. So, uh, and then you take South China Sea. So it's fascinating for me to understand where did the South China Sea dispute come from? It's the most important trade route in the world. It's also the sharpest point of contention from a strategic point of view between the United States and, and China, where you know our ships, you know, I have in the book several examples where there were near collisions with, of our of naval vessels. So uh, you know, all of that is unfolding at the same time. And you just worry about an, a, an accident and kind of the breakdown of communications, of channels of communication, if something does happen. Well, in a way, we've become so inward looking here in, you know, Washington and in the United States with our own uh, sort of explosively polarized politics. I think it's almost uh, distracted from this. I mean, you know, China is a slogan now wielded by the president, uh, you know, and he talks in ethnic derogatory terms about even the virus. Uh, but at the same time, there's not that much there's, there was more focus from a policy point of view, I would say, on the South China Sea in Washington, you know, in the ancient days of, you know, four years ago <laughs> and the Obama administration. But, you know, I think that's probably a smart prediction on your part that, you know, regardless of how much we're paying attention to it, that is probably one of the most strategic uh, fault lines in the right. world right now. I mean, you as a close observer of Washington every week, uh, don't you find it striking how this, how it's just, the attitudes have changed on both parties? On this. Absolutely. I think there's, there's no question uh, that one of the interesting effects, right, of the Trump era was Trump's rhetoric is very out there. Uh, and yet, um, coming in behind it, it's enabled uh, people across the board to recognize that, uh, you know, I think this is a piece by two top Obama administration officials who dealt with Asia, Kurt Campbell and Jake Sullivan, I was just looking at the other day from last summer, and you know they 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 too wrote, you know, the era of strategic engagement, you know, has come to an unceremonious end. Uh, so you really do have a consensus on that now. Now I want to get to our questioners, but Dan, I do want to go back to this, you know, to the Middle East and this question of, you know, essentially how long is energy and energy politics going to dominate? Uh, global politics. And you have this fascinating example of uh, uh, the UAE uh, just here uh, this week making peace that in a way might, might be related uh, to some of these questions of energy dependence and lack thereof. And you, you write about this incredible example in 2007, you know, you write well before the shift away from oil was widely accepted, uh, Abu Dhabi laid out its own economic vision for 2030. And the idea was essentially, once we've gotten rid of all of our oil, you know, can we build an economy that makes us no longer a petrostate? And you're right, it's already succeeding in, the, in that a country whose GDP was almost all oil two decades ago is now 60% non-oil. So is there something there that uh, other people can learn from, or is it just that that's such a small country it's able to do things well, other well, than it? So first, for those who you know, don't follow the geography, of course, Abu Dhabi is the largest and the most oil rich and the richest of the, um, of the Emirates that make up the United Arab Emirates that signed that deal uh, yesterday. Uh, I think it really helps that you have a, that it's a small population, it has a tradition of uh, outward looking. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is different from other, it's the only country I know of that has in its government a minister for tolerance. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, sort of openness, and I think it's reflected in this deal, but also in doing that, and the Crown Prince, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, he said, you know, should we be sad when the last barrel of oil leaves uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, or, or should we celebrate? He said, if we diversify our economy, we can celebrate. So they've done a good job, you know, good, good job. And, you know, they could, you know, to a, a degree, a model for other people, but I think it's hard to do, and you need a lot of ingredients, including the human capital, to do it. Well, it's very, I was just very intrigued by that. So I have to say, I, I wanted to ask about it. So, Dan, we've gotten a lot of good questions 
Uh, and I'm going to just jump right into those. I want to thank everybody, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. The first question, which keeps getting pushed down, uh, is about Iran. Uh, and if you could tell us a bit about um, you know, the state of its oil economy. And here, let me see if I can read this. Okay, with regard to the US maximum pressure policy on Iran, you know, what does that do to the future of Iran energy exports? Think about oil, natural gas, electricity. Well, well, well certainly, you know, it was really President Obama who first used these sanctions on Iranian oil to force them to the table. And uh, it, that was made possible because of shale, because we could replace their oil. Uh, the max, then of course, the uh, Trump administration gave up on the nuclear deal, walked away from it, and put these maximum pressure. So they're exporting very little oil. Uh, the condition of their oil industry is not in very good shape because, you know, just they haven't been able to invest and uh, access to technology and so forth. So their country with large resources in oil and gas, but they're not actually a very significant player right now, uh, as long as those, you know, the sanctions are in place. And the U.S. has this great tool that it can use in foreign affairs, which is called the dollar. And the, the fact that transactions flow through the dollar, and that is how they turn the wrench on sanctions. So right now, uh, in terms of oil and gas, uh, uh, particularly oil, because they really haven't gotten their gas exports together, Iran is sitting on the sidelines. Interesting. Uh, here's, here's from a fan of yours, uh, Donna Sangamino. She says, I really enjoyed the prize, uh, your book, of course, about oil, uh, the history of it. What do you think Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, the father of OPEC, as you referenced in that book, what would he say about what is happening right now to his homeland in Venezuela? So uh, he was one of the two fathers of OPEC. Uh, he got the idea from OPEC by actually looking at what was the Texas Railroad Commission, which actually regulates oil production in Texas. Uh, but he was scathing in a sense too about dependence on oil and, and the, he called it the devil's excrement in terms of what it would do to a country. And I think he would look at Venezuela today and just say, how is this opportunity wasted? How did this disaster happen? Country with the largest oil reserves in the world, producing almost nothing. It's the economy, you know, mothers, if they can, going across the border to just have their babies because there's no medicines in the hospital in Caracas. How was this, how, how was this all wasted? I think he would be shocked, if, beyond shocked and saddened by the, what the outcome has been. Yeah, so thank you for the question and thank you for the prize. Incredible tragedies. Um, okay, here's two quick uh, lightning round questions uh, having to do with uh, oil and uh, gas. Eric Ridgely writes, assuming economics drive consumer choices as opposed to fads, and assuming that environmental rules are more or less the same as they are now, and coronavirus goes away, uh, miraculously <laughs> or not, <laughs> he says due to vaccines, not due to a miracle. Um, He's looking for your idea about what's the equilibrium price of Brent crude oil and WTI crude oil for, say, 2030. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I went to the study on oil price forecasting called the perils of prophecy. That, you yes. know, there's a reason oil price forecasts are often wrong because there's so much else that's involved, technology, uh, uh, markets, regulation. So uh, I, I, wouldn't, I couldn't. Yes, I thought you were going to sort of say next year and take a stab at that, but uh, 2030. You could also say if you know and you're not going to tell him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, want, I actually want to keep it quiet. I don't want it to get out. No, it's a wonderful question, but it's just, <laughs> I, I think, you know, you look at the history of forecasting, it just misses things because it misses big, you know, not only the market, but, you know, misses a financial crisis in 2008. It misses the, you know, the coronavirus and there'll be other things that will, will happen. But I think that um, you know, the big debate right now is when does oil demand reach its peak and begin to decline? And some are now thinking it's looking at where we are today uh, as, as relative to COVID that it happens in the 2020s. I, I tend to still think it's in the 2030s, but I think we still don't really know what the lasting consequences on the economy are of, uh, of this, uh, really this disaster that we're living th through. You know, if you go through cities you see boarded up shops all these small businesses that are you know that are just lost and they're not going to be able to come back uh, but also look at how we're communicating tonight what is this you know is the nature 
nature of work and I, I, in, the, in, the map, in the new map, I speculate and say, you know, to a considerable degree, perhaps the office of the future is gonna be at home. Well, for some of us, that's good news. For some, it's not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Brian Okonski writes, uh, my understanding is that operators do not disclose the chemicals that are used in fracking. These chemicals could affect water supplies. Do you expect that they will be disclosed and also regulated in the future? Well, I think now I'd have to search. I mean, that was a big issue around 2012. I think, I think, this, I, I do believe now, I mean, I double check, but I remember the big issue. I do believe that they disclosed. There was a sensitivity at the beginning about it. So I think there's a lot of uh, information now about that. So I think, it, I think it's gone. Jerry Grossman uh, writes, why do you say that Republicans and Democrats agree about Russia concerns? It seems to Jerry that the Senate Republicans are in agreement with the president that Russia is our best buddy. No, I don't think, uh, you know, my reading of it since um, Three of the Republican senators are the ones who are introducing the bill to put sanctions on, uh, on this, ad, this go governmental authority in Germany because of Nord Stream 2, because it, quote, threatens our national security. I would say they are not on board with the president. I think there's a kind of, uh, I mean, there is, I mean, clearly the arguments about the impact, the Mueller question, the impact on our elections and uh, how that worked and interventional, that sort of thing. But I think that if you look at, you know, the Republicans voted for the sanctions too that were put on Nord Stream last uh, uh, December. So I think there's kind of the president over there and even his messages are mixed. You know, on the one hand this, on the other hand, you know, complaining to Chancellor Merkel, why are you buying gas from Russia when you could buy it from the United States? That so, is one of the mysteries. He's, he, he, on the one hand, constantly uses that as a club against Merkel. On the other hand, uh, you know, you can't imagine someone who's been more uh, favorably inclined toward Putin than, than Trump. So it's, it's yeah, very- Yeah, I, I mean, he, one thing that's pretty clear, he doesn't, he doesn't, he does not have a great relationship with Chancellor Merkel. <laughs> Despite what we were uh, recently told about their great chemistry. Yeah, exactly, the great chemistry. Apparently when she was, somebody asked her about that, she just had a kind of quizzical look on her face. Yeah, the video is very funny of that. Yeah. Um, okay, we got a number of really good questions, uh, more energy focused. Um, uh, Michael Nix asks, uh, when do you see the uh, uh, utility level storage being able to take full advantage of wind and solar energy and making those intermittent sources much less intermittent? That's right. the big issue with that. Yeah, so for those who don't follow, you know, just to explain what that means, wind and solar by intermittent, it means the sun has to shine, the wind has to blow. And, you see in California, when that doesn't occur, then you end up with brownouts and so forth, and you need to use natural gas uh, to balance the supply. So uh, I was just uh, talking, you know, at a virtual conference on the electric utility industry, and there's a big drive to move towards renewables, to, you know, move towards lower and lower carbon and so forth. But I mean, the big blocking item is storage of renewable energy. So. I would say batteries, you know, the thing to keep your eye on is large scale batteries, not, you know, batteries that just last for two hours, but uh, that you can really store large amounts of power. And if that happens, that would constitute, you know, I don't want to use the word revolutionary, but it would, it would mean a major change in, in the system. A couple more that are, you know, in the, related to this question of the energy transformation. Craig Glazer asks, what are the implications here uh, very aggressive renewable requirements coming from states and from the Biden campaign of up to 80% of electricity consumption coming from renewable resources by 2030. And well, what does the recent California experience tell us about whether such policies are, are workable? Well, I think you, I think the question has answered it, that uh, you have to, you know, the stability of the system, you know, running a, an electric power grid is a really complicated thing because you have to deliver power. I mean, look what we're doing and in fact, the whole system is more and more dependent upon reliable electricity. And I think there are real questions about being able to run a system, you know, uh, at that level, um, you know, 80% on a renewable basis, that just the capabilities not there. And I think the California case has to be looked at to, to help understand about pacing and, and scale of it. So 
that's a you know that's a very good uh, uh, pointer, uh, and you know that's a lot of that would be a lot of investment to to do that on on top of it, everything else. So I think uh, I think you know if you if you look out another decade by 2040, you you can start to see you know much higher volumes, but that question of storage of electricity has that has to that's one of the great technological frontiers that has to be crossed. We're almost out of time. We'll try to get uh, two quick ones more. Elizabeth Calamari asks uh, about the introduction of the electric car and how has that uh, affected gas prices? And do you have any thoughts about the future of these electric cars uh, and how that might affect oil and gas industry? Well, there's a great, two great pictures in the book of Thomas Edison standing next to his electric car and Elon Musk standing next to his electric car. That's and it's right. like Elon Musk is the reincarnation of Thomas Edison because his electric car didn't, didn't gain traction. The, the Tesla has certainly gained traction. Uh, and I guess Tesla was also sort of, I hadn't thought about it, kind of Edison's great opponent. So that makes it even more interesting. Uh, so I think he's established a brand and he's established a legitimacy and you're seeing the automobile industry seeking to pivot but it still depends upon you know pretty considerable support and incentives from governments and so i think a lot of uh the speed of electric cars will partly depend upon uh governments and then the other part of it is uh is do, do large number of consumers want them and when will they want them so uh, you know the in the book you know we've done a lot of scenario work and you know, we have 1.4 billion cars in the world, maybe by 2050, we'll have 2 billion and estimate maybe 600 million of them, uh, about 40% will be electric cars. Maybe the number will be higher if government policy or if there are again advances in the battery, but all the major automobile makers are gearing up to move in an elect EV direction. Well, and I guess that momentum, uh, once it once it gets going right, it's it's hard to turn it around, as you document in the book. We are just about out of time. Uh, for one last time, in case you haven't already bought the book, The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. Uh, I'm shamelessly flacking for the book so that Dan doesn't have to, at least for this moment. Uh, but you really should buy it. And uh, I'm sure Dan will be happy to uh, sign your copies or stop in the bookstore sometime and do that too. Dan, one final effort at uh, prognostication. The, the, the questioners all seem to want you to tell them the future. Uh, this one wants to know if OPEC will still even be around in 10 years. So let's close on that. Okay, well, I think OPEC will be around sort of more as a trade association uh, than the OPEC, uh, the fierce OPEC that we knew in the 70s or uh, 80s. So let me thank you, Susan. Let me thank Politics and Pros and say that we should all tune in on October 1st for the man who ran Washington with some guidance for thinking about uh, not only the past, but also to think about the future. So thank you, Susan. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Politics and Pros. Yes, thank you very much. I thought those were great questions. Uh, and uh, thanks again to everyone for tuning in. And have thank a great you. day. Thank you.